Hi, everybody. I just ran in from the other room. I just forgot to turn a radio off over there. So I'm like, I'm just a little bit out of breath. But uh, welcome. Welcome to the virtual night sky tonight. Uh, this is our May 5th Cinco de Mayo. This is our May 5th version of virtual night sky. We've got a nice program for you tonight. I'll explain to you what we're going to do in a second. Uh, but I want to welcome everybody. Uh, and I want to uh, introduce myself and my team here. So this my name is Rick Alling. And I'm the director of the Marston Theater. And so many of you we know from experience are joining us for maybe the first time tonight. <clears throat> And uh, maybe uh, some of you have been with us before. So we always like to do the introductions just to make sure you know what's going on. Um, we, um, my name is Rick Elling, and as I said, and uh, in, the, in the background here, Kim Baptista, you'll hear from her a little bit tonight, but she is uh, our webmaster. She's the one that does the, um, uh, the communications. She sets up the webinars and uh, she's helping keep everything orderly and running. She also will field your questions afterwards and she also will send you a survey after the program in a couple of days just to sort of uh, so we can we can find out how you feel about what we're doing. Uh, Meg Hufford is my colleague and she's with us all the time and I just love having her support and her ideas and uh, and she kind of keeps us organized and keeps us running as well. We've got three students with us tonight. Sperti Kachere is here, uh, Alicia Hyatt and Alex Blanche and uh, I think all three of them you've seen before. Uh, they're going to be handling different parts of the show. Uh, just some uh, little housekeeping things. Uh, we can't chat but we can question and answer. So if you have a question along the way, um, uh, please just go ahead and open the little question and answer box there. Uh, if you're a student, I'd like to know kind of what grade level you might be in. So if you're an elementary student or a high school or a college level, uh, maybe a first name and a grade level, that would be super. And then go ahead and ask your question. That'll be, they'll be being answered in the background and several of them will be brought up during the program to, uh, to do during breaks. And that'll be good. Uh, we do uh, closed captioning. Uh, you might see it. Uh, it's called that live transcript button there. Um, you can actually turn it off. You don't have to have it on your screen. Some people like it, some people don't. You can turn it off, but what it does is it gets recorded and then it makes it really easy for us to post these programs on uh, YouTube. And I think you're going to hear about that a little bit later after the fact. And if you want to go look, uh, we're going to send you to a link uh, for the School of Earth and Space Exploration where you can find this and other valuable, really wonderful uh, programs and YouTubes and little movies about what we have going on. There's always some exciting stuff going on at the school for sure. Uh, this was graduation week. Uh, so we've actually compressed everything. We skipped spring break, right? The sort of COVID thing. Um, we decided we didn't want students going out for spring break and then coming back. So we just skipped it. And that means everything ended about a week early. And so here it is the very first part of May. And uh, we're started moving into the summer mode, but we're going to keep this program going uh, over the next couple of months and uh, into the fall. So uh, so don't worry about us every other week, we'll be back and, and do that. Tonight, I'm going to kind of talk to you a little bit about planets, uh, especially the inner planets, especially the ones that you'll be able to see in the evening sky. Well, actually starting maybe even tonight. So there's uh, uh, the Mercury, Venus and uh, and Mars are about to put on the show. Uh, they all operate in their own way. They all have their own characteristics. And we'll kind of go over that a little bit tonight and what to look for. And then a brief break. And then I thought we'd spend some time talking about constellations. What makes a constellation? How many constellations are there? Where did they come from? And we're going to particularly focus on one a superhero that we haven't gotten to in the entire year. Uh, Hercules is going to be the um, uh, the focus of tonight's program. So uh, Hercules, the constellation, and uh, uh, how to find it, and what that's all about in, in history and in mythology and lore and some new stuff going on. I'm going to introduce you to this idea about using binoculars to see your night sky tonight. And we're going to uh, show you a resource of um, uh, how to find some things and uh, a quick resource to know what's available by the naked eye, what's available by binoculars, and what's available by a telescope if you want to uh, sort of look at a reference. Um, and then uh, there's a meteor shower tonight. I don't know if you knew it, but Eta, Eta Aquarians are happening. They're peaking tonight. And Alicia will give us a little primer on what to do, what to watch for. So got a huge full program. And so I'm just going to start with a share. I'm using uh, some of the facilities from uh, the school uh, that Marston Theater actually operates with a really nice, beautiful, sophisticated system uh, that uh, gives us uh, sort of a, a, a 3D views of the night sky. And I've actually borrowed it. I brought it home so, so you can see a little bit about what we're looking at here. So I'm free flying a little bit. And this, sometimes I would sort of like let it get started and catch up. It'll be a little jerky at the start. But I'm coming in from outer space and I'm headed for 
um, uh, our solar system. And so you might not recognize it, but that's the sun in the middle of the screen. And uh, those are uh, uh, sort of planets buzzing around the sun. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go just a little bit slower so the machine can catch up to what I'm doing. If I put the orbits up, that's gonna be a little bit more recognizable. Yeah, that's probably a little bit more what you're used to. So um, the four rings in the middle, uh, that's the sun and the four inner rocky planets, the inner part of the solar system. And then the rings that are way outside, I'll back up a little bit so you can see those. Uh, those are the gas giants. So Jupiter, Saturn, um, Uranus, and Neptune. And it just so happens, uh, it just kind of just a quirk of just the time right now, um, that the four, uh, that, that the three inner rocky planets that are not the Earth, actually, let me blow them up a little bit so you can kind of just see them. I can make them a little bigger so they're, they're bigger on the screen. There they go. Um, are actually on one side of the sun. And the outer gas giants are on the other side of the sun. So our solar system is kind of divided in half with little planets on one half and big planets on the other. If I fly in here a little bit, I just want to sort of show you the view that we get from the Earth uh, looking at these planets. Now, I, I oversize them. They're blown up thousands of times bigger than they are, just so you can see what's going on. But the Earth is in the four screen here. And so when we look at those planets, we're on the earth, but we're all in our own orbits. We're all doing our thing. We're all moving. And so I think you can see here from this thing, if I, well, actually let me roll over and kind of like make it sort of a top down view. So you can see the sun now is on the bottom. And imagine for a moment, the sun is going below the horizon. Uh, the first planet we're gonna see just above the horizon, above the sun is Venus. You can see it in the orbit there. Maybe I can point to it right here, this one, this one right here. Uh, the other planet that's in this view is Mercury. and it's in its orbit and it just sort of like it's going to find its place right there. Um, and then I kind of just moved uh, Mars out of the scene. If I roll over a little bit, you can sort of see that uh, Mars will come back into view and, and it'll be a lot higher in the sky. So in a moment, I'm going to take you away from this, this big view, the solar system view from the outside looking in. And I'm going to just take you right down to Earth. I'm going to show you essentially from my driveway uh, what this is going to look like, what we get to see and when we get to see it. But just remember that order of things. So so uh, Venus will be closest to the sun, Mercury right next to it, next to the sun, and then Mars up a little higher in the sky. Does that sound fair enough? <clears throat> Okay, now I got to do a little bit of manipulating and moving around. So I'm going to kind of be distracted. I'll try to talk as I'm doing this. I'm going to land on the earth. This is a little bit jerky. Watch out. It's going to poof, poof. Um, uh, give us a thing. I'm going to kind of spin the uh, screen around so that I'm actually facing uh, uh, towards the, the west part of the sky. Let me turn those orbits on. You don't have to see that, but I will put the labels on. I'm going to just label for a moment Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And uh, then I'm also going to uh, just kind of like load up a little scene so it makes it look like we're sitting on my driveway looking across the street. My neighbor across the street, the lady that owns the house, is named Marcine. So you'll see Marcine's house come into view here in just a moment. Uh, there it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move forward to uh, kind of right by the end of the show tonight. So I'm going to just actually maybe even, uh, uh, I'm going to move forward to seven. 50 uh, tonight. And what you're going to see is that by 750, the sun will have gone below the horizon over there. You see, uh, see the Mercury marquee parked in the driveway. And look at that. Remember when we were in space and we were looking at those planets, which one was closest to the sun? It was Venus. And then the next one, just a little bit further away, was Mercury. And then kind of way up in the sky is Mars. So this is tonight. This is right. So and, and Venus is just starting to show up. And I'll show you some magical things that Venus is going to do in the next couple of weeks uh, and actually the next couple of months. Um, but the reason to show you this tonight is that this is going to be really hard to catch at first. So you can try this. You can be the first person person on your block to see Venus arriving in your evening sky. Starting now, it should be visible. I think I saw it uh, day before yesterday because I was out looking. Uh, you have to let the sun go down. You have to let it get a little bit dark, but Venus is so bright 
it cuts through even the twilight sky. So you should be able to see it. Now, I'm not going to let you go before eight o'clock because we'll still be talking. But right at eight o'clock, you better run outside and you better turn. If you have a really good view of the Western horizon, I'll bet you can see it. If you miss it tonight, just keep looking. Uh, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, just right at sunset, try to get a Western view and you'll see Venus start to make an appearance. Okay. I want to just show you uh, some things going on. And uh, if we just move ahead, oh gosh, I'm going to move we had one week uh, just uh, 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 this is uh, one week from tonight <clears throat> And I'm kind of just going to give it like a little sort of five second move ahead there. See, watch that. See how Venus is getting a little bit higher in the sky. Mercury is getting a little bit higher in the sky. And then the moon arrived on the scene. So one week from tonight on Wednesday, Venus will be up a little higher. It'll be right there after dark. And you're going to see this really, really sliver moon, just a little tiny, tiny sliver of a moon. So all of these things are going to come into play. Let me just move forward one more week. And this will be the next time we meet at our uh, virtual night sky. So I've moved up to May 19th. Look at the moon has kind of moved ahead a little bit and everything has moved up a little bit in the sky. So you see uh, uh, Venus up a little higher, Mercury up a little higher and all that stuff. As we go forward quite a little bit, then what's going to happen is uh, Mercury will reach its final sort of point, its greatest elongation from the sun, and then it'll dive back down to the earth. But Venus is going to keep going. Now that it's a visible in the evening sky, uh, it will be up until the first of the year. And I'm just going to show you something really, really cool. Let me set this up. So what I did is I uh, ran a little simulation for Venus starting on May 19th. That's our next visit. And I'm going to turn on uh, trail here, and I'm going to move forward. And so watch what these planets do and watch what they do over the course of the next nine months. So here they go. Here we go. So uh, this is basically showing you a little bit after sunset every single evening. Sorry, it's, it's a little jerky because of the way they go. We're going to pass Mars in July. In fact, there's a conjunction. We'll talk to you about that when we get to July for sure. Venus will keep going. See how Mercury just appears every once in a while, just peeked over Marcin's house there for a little bit. Venus is going to take this really, really high climb into the sky. In fact, it's going to go off screen just for a second, and then it'll come back again. There it goes. So it's way into the southwest, coming back around, and then it's going to just dive right into the earth. There's Mercury uh, trading places with it again. This is really wild. And so what's happening is Venus is moving in its orbit. It's coming around from behind the sun. It will go out and it'll spend about 260 days sort of on that side of the sun. Every single night it'll be in the sky. It'll get a little higher. After beginning about June, it's going to start heading south. See how it's just kind of like moving uh, almost to the south. Uh, it will achieve its greatest elongation somewhere around August or September and then uh, spin around, do a little loop-de-loop -loop and move back into the... I just love Venus. I love talking about it. We will have some cultural shows about how the Maya saw Venus and how they kept track of it and some of the math that goes into how often it does this funny little thing and how that works. We'll be doing that in future shows. But I just want to kind of give you this sense, uh, give you a little thing to look at give us some planets to study. And so just as a little bit of a recap, here's what's going to happen. The three inner rocky planets are going to start being visible right about now. Uh, tonight, you might be able to see them tomorrow, next day, certainly for sure. Uh, look just as it's getting dark and you'll see it. Uh, if you wait for a week or two, you're going to see Venus pass Mercury. It might be easier to see Mercury then because it's not as bright. It's kind of dim. It might just look like a little know-nothing star. But if you see the two of them together, I think you'll get, a, get the sense that it's, it's Venus and Mercury. And then uh, Mars, we've been watching it in the night sky for a while. It's just starting its journey down into, it'll get lost in the sunset uh, about the end of July. So it's going to get a little bit dimmer, a little bit further away, and a little bit harder to see. But we're going to see this wonderful conjunction between Venus and Mars uh, July 12th. And we're planning something really special. We're going to try to invite some Indian friends, people from India that have astronomical societies and groups. We're going to try to get them to image Mars during their night. And we're going to image Mars during our night. And we're going to see who gets the best view of Mars during that 24 hour period. So that's kind of cool. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm going to stop this and set up a different machine. It's going to take a little break right now. Normally we don't do it this early, but I'm going to invite the team back. We're going to do a little, uh, a little poll and, and, uh, some question to answer, and then I'll be right back with you a little conversation about constellations, okay? Thanks.
Thank you so much, Rick. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and launch our polls. Uh, and now would be a great time if you haven't already to ask a question in our Q&A. We will be on uh, momentarily to take those. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and launch our first poll. Uh, and so our first question is, how many virtual night, virtual night shows have you attended? Our second is, in the legend Hercules, how many tasks did he have to complete? Little curveball there. Uh, and then our third question is, where are you viewing from? So we're interested to know where you are uh, in a non-creepy way, um, because uh, as Rick mentioned, we have uh, a special current events section to talk about. So make sure you're filling those polls out. And Sue, if you want to come on and take a question or two, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, so right now, we don't have any unanswered questions, but maybe I can just um, take one, which we've already answered, in case you haven't really um, re read the answers. So a good one was um, Rick uh, by Arman. So um, he said, Arman says, you mentioned there was a meteor shard night. And uh, my question is, how do we keep them and the other meteors and asteroids from colliding with thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth? <laughs> so that's a good question. And um, the answer to that is that asteroids are really huge rocks, which are not really the rocks that burn up during a meteor shower. Um, when they come close enough to the Earth, they are quite detectable. And um, what meteor showers generally are made up of are debris from either comets or other interspace inter um, rocks. They're fragments of other big rocks that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, which is uh, what Alicia will be talking about more in um, the coming section. But uh, if they do collide with the satellites, it can only possibly just make uh, like a little dent in the satellites, depending on the speed of collision. So um, they, they don't really destroy satellites, but that's a good question. So back to you, Alicia. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, again, please keep asking those questions in the Q&A, and if we don't answer them live, we will try and get to them in the chat. Uh, but with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the polls. And so our first question was, how many virtual night, sco virtual night shows have you attended? And uh, a majority of us have attended 10 or more, and that's wonderful. We're so happy to have you back, and we hope that everybody uh, keeps attending these virtual night sky shows. Number two, uh, in The Legend of Hercules, how many tasks did he have to complete? And Rick's going to be happy about this. 58% of us got it right without- um, Good for you guys. Without, yeah, I know, pretty awesome. Uh, and that was 12. So yes, the correct answer is 12 tasks. And then our last question was, where are you viewing from? And 75% of us are viewing from Arizona. So uh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Rick, back to you. Thank you. Um, excellent. That's really good. So what we what we are finding is that a lot of people are telling friends and family in other places in other states about the program. And so, so we get, uh, we get questions and we get pe people uh, calling in from really all over the place. And then one of the natural questions comes up is how much of what we're talking about tonight is relevant in their night sky. And the answer is it, it really all is because of time zones and everything. That thing I was just showing you, for example, uh, Venus and how to find it and looking right after sunset well everybody in the united states can look right after sunset and they will essentially see the same activity those move fairly slowly there's other things that are site specific like um like eclipses and things like that uh, that's where you sort of have to really sort of be in the right place at the right time but for the most part night sky viewing the constellations the seasons and most of the stuff we talk about doesn't matter i mean we sort of the latitude of the united states is about the same across uh, uh, and uh, and the time zones kind of make the time change for us, and uh, it, it's pretty easy to do. I'm going to launch a program. I'm really going to take a deep dive into constellations because every once in a while I get questions about, you know, what makes a constellation? How are they named? How long have they been there? Um, you know, what's part of a constellation? What's not? Uh, what's an asterism? What's a constellation? We have all kinds of, of different sort of questions. So let me just share a screen here real quick. I've got a PowerPoint presentation and, and um, I'll just kind of like move that onto the screen and we'll see where we go from here. I just, uh, let me see. I'm going to just move backwards quite a little bit, back to the beginning. Um, I'm going to show you this 
a particular part of the sky here. What uh, you're seeing is in the lower left hand kind of part of your screen, I'm sorry, the lower, lower right side of your screen, this orange star over here is called Arcturus. And it's one of the brightest stars in the sky right now. And towards the end of the program, I'm going to show you exactly how to find it. So it's going to be up tonight. You'll be able to find that tonight and you'll see it. Um, up more closer to the center of the screen, a little bit off to the left, this star over here is called Vega. And Vega is part of a little constellation called Lyre. What I want to do is I'm concentrating on, and I'm going to find Hercules for you guys tonight, but we're kind of looking at this area right in between those two stars. Um, and that's again, so that really makes them very easy to find because you got two bright anchors. And then the stars I'm going to be kind of talking to you about are a little bit dimmer, but they're right in the middle. So here is a constellation called Bootes. And so Arcturus, the bright uh, orange star, is the alpha star of a constellation called Bootes. And we've talked about Bootes in past shows. I'm going to mention a little bit in two weeks because of its seasonality. Uh, Bootes is really a great uh, constellation to talk about how the sky matches your seasons and relates to uh, activity that we have on Earth. So Bootes is really kind of cool. But for tonight, we're going to skip that. This over here, this little tiny constellation is the lyre. It's actually sort of like a little heartbeat thing, right? And, uh, and uh, the bright star, like I said before, is called um, uh, Vega and the liar is the other one. In between those are two other constellations. One is called Corona Borealis. It's, it means Northern Crown. It's just a little semicircle. The bright star here is called Alpeca. And it is actually, it's one that you're going to be able to see. I think if, from Phoenix, these are actually seeable. And you have to have fairly good conditions. You probably don't want a full moon. You want it kind of dark. You want to get away from lights. But these are not obscure, like can't see them. These are sort of uh, those, you just have to hunt a little bit to find. Mind. And then next to that over here, the thing to look for is this thing we call the keystone. This little shape right here in the sky, this sort of little stick figure that makes this little shape called a keystone, this is going to be the trunk or the skirt or the whatever of the superhero Hercules. Let me sort of get his label up there so you can see that. And so really I'm just concentrating on these four constellations, but Hercules is really going to be the subject of our program tonight. And then I'm going to talk more generally about all constellations. Um, we kind of organize constellations by their little stick figures. And so it just gives us that sense of what relates to others. You don't really see these sticks in the sky. That's not happening but it gives us a chance to sort of like see the shapes and understand the shapes that we're going to look for in order to find these. So in here, you're going to find the keystone. In reality, if you, I mean, it's pretty easy to see there's an upside down guy here and he's kneeling. So there's a leg coming out this way. There's a leg coming out this way. This is the skirt that superheroes wore in mythology. An arm is up here with a club. His head is sort of in this general area and the other arm is out here holding something we're going to learn about. I'm going to just kind of, like add a little bit of sort of little sketch artwork. This comes from the planetarium program we have at the theater. I'm going to turn it around. It's it's a little bit dense and it's a little bit hard to read because it's upside down. So I'm going to flip him over for a second. So Hercules actually is upside down in space. So his feet are facing north. His head is facing south. He's head to head with another constellation called Ophioscus that is sort of like a more uh, in the more traditional upright position. In this particular view, now, Arcturus, the orange star is up over here. Um, Vega, the other star is over here. But I want to kind of point out a couple of things that you're always going to see when you see representations, artistic representations of Hercules. Uh, he's always going to be kneeling. And so his feet are sort of like that. He's always going to have a club in one arm. He's always going to have a lion pelt hanging over him. He's always going to be sort of uh, engaging something out in this area. In this case, it's the three-headed dog called Cerberus. And then he's always going to have a bow and arrow. So those are the things you can look for it through history, any star chart, any sort of historic or antique star chart, chart, you're going to see the same thing. Let me, let me add one for you. So I'm going to sort of, uh, this is a, a chart I borrowed, and I'm showing you this sort of interim image here. I'm going to make it brighter and bigger. But for right now, I want you to see how the stick figure is in the background. And I'm just taking an antique star map 
from 1820s and I'm layering it right on top of Hercules where he is in sky. Okay, so you can see the sticks in the background. If I make it a little brighter and denser, the sticks disappear, but this is where we're at. So over here, remember, this is, uh, I switched it back so he's upside down now, right? Uh, this is Arcturus over here, the red star, and you can see part of Boatees, his body and stuff like that, just kind of inching onto the chart up in this, in this particular direction. You see that over there? Here's the crown. You can even see just sort of like a little detail. I got a better detail of this in a moment here, but this bright star right here is the one we called Alpeca right there. Uh, here is Vega and the lyre and all that stuff. And now I'm going to kind of concentrate on this guy. Embedded in this artwork is many of his tasks. Remember, we made that a question. So, so Hercules, the, the, it's a story that could take an hour to tell, but the, the short version of it is, uh, is uh, he was actually uh, uh, made by Hera, to the uh, goddess, the wife of Zeus, to go crazy, and he ended up killing his family. And in order to make up for that, they sent him off to do some very, very severe and special tasks. He was always He's known as a strong man, and he had to do those things to, as penance for going crazy and killing his family, but also uh, he would win immortality by doing that. This was one of those things where they, they sort of gave you a chance to, to uh, uh, move from mortal to godlike. Um, so the first task was to kill the Nemean lion. And the Nemean lion was known for his uh, tough skin. It was impenetrable. You couldn't like shoot him with arrows. You couldn't throw rocks at it. Didn't do any good. Any way to sort of like solve the lion problem uh, was not going to work by traditional means. And it, the lion was terrorizing the land of Nemea. So the first task was to have Hercules go there and subdue this lion. Well, he realized very quickly that his arrows and all of that stuff wasn't going to work, but he used his smarts and he actually ended up jumping on the back of the lion and strangling it to death. He had to have the strength to do that. He had to have the bravery to do that. And he had to have the smarts to try something to kill this lion that wasn't the traditional means. After that, he skinned the lion and then he wears it later uh, for the rest of his things. It still has the powers. So now because he has this lion pelt hanging uh, as he's sort of like wearing it on his body, he is now impervious to all of those things. You know, I just sometimes wonder about, you know, the popularity of like Dungeons and Dragons and uh, Pokemon and all that stuff. You know how these games work is where you have a task, you got to go do something, you got to go find something. But along the way, you get to pick up these little attributes and chits and things like that, little things. Uh, you can use your brains, you can have this kind of thing. You actually earn points and earn uh, techniques that you can use later in the game. This is exactly how that starts. I mean, my mother always said, there's only a couple stories in the world and they've all been told, this is really one of them. And so, uh, so anyway, the lion is always part of Hercules in there. Uh, the arrows actually are important too, because his next task, the second task was to actually subdue Hydra, the water snake. And this was really hard. His, his nephew was with him and this was a snake. You cut off a head, it grows another one. It had multiple heads and all of this stuff. They finally agreed to work together. Hercules would chop off the head uh, Ion, uh, Iolaus would actually sort of take a little hot iron and cauterize the wound right away. And eventually they subdued this thing. But before he left, right, he used this toxin that had gathered in the gall of this water snake and he dipped his arrows in it. And so he created poison arrows from the snake. So here's another task and another thing that he takes with him that gives him actually a little bit extra power as he goes along. So you're always going to see him with the bow and arrow. Uh, the other thing are the two later tasks. And let me sort of show you what that is. There's a little detail here. Uh, in this particular case, Hercules is holding this like branch of apples. And you see down here, it's actually written right here. It's called Ramus Pomifer. That means in French, branch of apples. And uh, this goes from the 11th task where he was to steal the apples from the garden, uh, garden of Hephaestus. And uh, it was guarded by a dragon and it was a tough task, but he meant it. It was also Hera's favorite garden and Hera did not like, as you already know, Hercules. So it was actually super extra dangerous. Um, I'm gonna go back a scene here because because I just wanted to show you just right up here in the margin of this chart are two stars that belong to Draco the dragon. And he is always shown here with his foot sort of on the head of the dragon as he subdued it in order to sort of steal the apples and get them out of there. So there's another reference, another relationship in the night sky to this major story. Uh, back to this other one, you see the 
three-headed thing in this particular thing. It's labeled Cerberus. Cerberus was the three-headed dog uh, that was uh, guarding the entry, the gates to Hades. And so the task was, this was his 12th and last task. It was supposed to be impossible. There's absolutely no way to do this. He went down uh, to uh, subdue and he was supposed to bring Cerberus back again. He did it by plying Cerberus with wine and that seemed to work and he got his task done and he brought it out. But you see that they're marking this. This is sort of your both of these tasks are sort of intertwined here and they're always in this thing and so in the label here that's called Cerberus a ramus and palmifer that's two of them together. Sometimes you see one, sometimes you see the other, like that other little sketch drawing I had, sometimes you see both together. Now, right now, that whole thing is kind of part of one constellation, but at one time, that was a whole separate costume of the constellation. There was one called Cerberus. So uh, it's kind of fun to remember that those things. I'm gonna show you that a little bit later. The other thing I wanna show you about constellations and stars, getting away from the artwork and getting away from how they're labeled and how they're described and all that stuff. Constellations seem like they're a two-dimensional flat uh, thing stuck to the dome of the sky above us. I mean, that's how we act. That's how we treat them. That's how the artwork looks, right? When you see a star chart, it's not dimensional. You don't see some of those stars are closer and some are farther away. And so I did a little simulation. We're going to actually start from Earth and we're going to fly out towards Hercules. And I want you to watch really, really closely what happens to the stars as we get out there. I'm going to, I'm going to move us forward about seven parts parsecs, about 25 light years. And I'm going to give you a little heads up. I might play it a couple of times just so you can see. Remember, this is Vega and Vega is kind of close to us. And then watch the shape. Watch what happens to the shape as we sort of like move towards it and see if you can get a sense of which of these stars are closer to us and which ones are farther away. So I'm going to start it here. Let's see if this, this works. I know it's a little jerky because of the way we play it. So, so now we've, we've moved forward. Oops, hang on just a second. I can, I'm gonna move that back so you can see where it is. And I'm gonna freeze it right there. So if we were closer to it, if we fly towards Hercules a little bit, you can see that these stars out here are close to us and they're sort of like almost drifting by us. This is part of the arm. Uh, uh, Vega, just off to the side over here, has already passed us. Uh, these stars out here, the bottom of the keystone and maybe this leg and maybe some of these other stars are really, really, really far in the distance. And so I want to sort of like just kind of plant in our brains a little bit that we, when we look at the night sky, the star that we see are very much from an earth perspective. It's us looking up at the sky. It's us sort of uh, uh, from our place looking at stars. And so the shapes and everything are organized for us and our history has put them together and designed their little stick figures and their little artwork and all of that stuff as if you're here. You don't have to be too far away from the earth, uh, more farther than we can get. But if you're several light years away in any direction, forward, backwards, other, the stars will tar start to take on a different shape because they're not on a dome over our heads. The stars themselves have distance. And so uh, for us, uh, uh, we get to see our constellations. We get to see them where they are consistently and constantly. But if you were a space traveler, uh, that wouldn't make any difference. Constellations are only a earthbound activity. Uh, they only show us what we see from, from right here. And so uh, moving forward, I want to just uh, kind of, oops, let me get past that a little bit. I wanted to just kind of give you a little sense of how constellations are named and how they got to be. So I created uh, several little charts here, and I'm going to take you through the history of constellations and how to see these things. So what you see in front of you is the names of the constellations that date back to uh, the day of the days of Ptolemy. And so the very, very first reference, the very first compilation of star charts, the very first time that there was a written record of, of uh, constellations uh, dates back to 150 AD. Uh, Claudius Ptolemaeus was actually a, a mathematician at the time. He was in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, and what he didn't invent these constellations, 
constellations, but he just found all of the records and he organized everything that had been talked about. The constellations on this chart, there are 48 of them date back centuries and actually millennia before um, AD. Uh, that was, I mean, the Assyrians, the Babylonians used some of these. Look up over here, you can see sort of uh, the constellations I just showed you on the screen, Bootes, uh, Corona Borealis over here, Hercules right there, and Lyre. So I have them kind of in the juxtaposition where they are in the sky. But that means because you're seeing them on this chart, they are ancient. They date back years and years and years and years, okay? Not long after that, just a little tiny bit after um, uh, this was all organized in a document called Almagest, and you can look that up and sort of find out he was responsible for that. It's kind of the first compilation of everything we knew about astronomy after the Greek and Roman ages and things like that. Well, another obscure constellation was added about, oh, uh, 150 years later. It's called Coma Bernices. It's actually sort of like the tuft of the tail on Leo the lion. Uh, it's just a little sort of open cluster in space. It's really beautiful to look at, especially with binoculars. We're going to talk to you a little bit more about binoculars later, uh, but it's a really good one to say. So now we have uh, not mm, 48 constellations that are ancient, but one more, so 49 that date back. Also, I want you to notice this Argo Navis here. That is the like the, the ship that Jason and the Argonauts sailed uh, for their tasks and their duties. It used to be considered one big constellation and it was well established by this time, this early time. Uh, it's gonna change a little bit. That's why I have, a, have it in a different color. The next time we see anything um, is in 1603. Uh, another volume, another volume of charts come out and it's called Uranometria. And in that particular thing, what they were doing is taking the knowledge that navigators that were sailing all over the world started to bring back. So the Dutch were in charge of this. All the cartographers in the best cartographers in the world lived in uh, Holland and Germany. Uh, uh, the Dutch basically ruled the seas, especially from a merchant standpoint. And every time a sailor would come back or the captain, the navigators from a ship would come back from their travels in the southern part of the world, they would come back and report what they saw. So all of those green uh, names down here, you can see they're organized way down towards the southern part of our skies. And you can see that they sort of favor uh, things like um, uh, uh, exotic birds and exotic fish, things that you don't see. Chameleon is down here. Europeans would have never seen a chameleon before ships sailed to the southern part of the country. And so these are constellations that got organized in the southern part of the sky uh, in that area below where the original Greeks and Mediterranean cultures were. The next time, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> um, about 10 years later, uh, this guy was a, uh, a priest or a minister, and he added two more constellations, and these still exist today. Camelopardalus, hard to see, but it is in your night sky, and it's a boy by your North Pole. Columba is another bird down here, and it's made from part of uh, Canis Major. So, so two more. Uh, much later, uh, a Pole, a Polish uh, astronomer named um, um, Havelius is his name, and uh, I can't remember his his first name. Anyway, Havelius actually added, he actually wanted to add 10 constellations to the to the map here, but ended up only seven of them were adopted. You notice that they're northern again. So now we're not navigating the summer, the southern seas anymore and adding those to the things. But here is a, an astronomer based in Poland. So he's a northern hemisphere guy. And he's basically adding uh, dim constellations in between some of the ancient constellations that we already know. No. One of the three that did not get adopted, by the way, was a constellation called Cerberus. He was on it. He actually said, we need a constellation named Cerberus attached to Hercules. Uh, it didn't get accepted. So anyway, but for a little while there, there was actually a Cerberus on the constellation trail. The next one is actually kind of interesting. Again, favoring the South. All of these orange names I just, just entered uh, were actually not done until 1763. A French astronomer added all these and finally, finally, it was like 1763 before we got a constellation at the Southern Pole. 
So the southern sky, um, uh, uh, we have a north celestial pole, a south celestial pole is surrounded by a constellation called Octans. It took until 1763 to get a constellation in that area. And then look at this. These are not exotic creatures like the blue ones that were sort of like named uh, 300 years ago. Uh, but these are actually, these are things that are modern technologies, equipment and things. This is actually a water, uh, air pump, a vacuum pump, uh, a microscope, a telescope. These are uh, the little compass you use for drafting, a furnace, a clock, a chisel. Uh, these are sort of the things that sort of like filled in the sky. And so, so you can see how we start with the original ones and then we add and add and add uh, as, as we go along. Uh, we're almost done here. The next thing that happens is in 1924, 88 of the constellations already sort of in use and in charts were officially accepted by the International Astronomical Union. And this is kind of strange because they removed, if you want, remember Argo Navis used to be here. Uh, they removed Argo Navis because um, in the La Carrier era, uh, he actually divided it into three constellations, Pupus, Vela, and Carina. And so uh, the uh, Astronomical Union decided they didn't need Argo Navis anymore. And this is really how we landed with the 88 constellations that we know today. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, that's, and this is fixed and it's not going anywhere. Here's the exciting part of this, okay? So the 48 original constellations, the ones that included all of the constellations of the Zodiac, several of them in the Northern Hemisphere, southern, several of them in the Southern Hemisphere, still exist. One of the amazing things about astronomy is as we discover new things and more things and every iteration of, 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 of change in how we organize the night sky, we never got rid of these original constellations, the stories and the mythologies that sort of made them meaningful to those people of the day. Remember those stories, uh, the Hercules story was, was, was made up when almost zero people in the world read they didn't read things, right? And all of these stories would be sort of placed in the sky in such a way that people could see them, remember them, pass those stories on from generation to generation to generation. And we still have the benefit of that today. So this is a really tremendous legacy. And you can see in here places, the green ones, where there was a time when uh, the, 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 the things that they were discovering in the Southern part of the world were important to these people. Later, uh, the things that they're discovering the instruments and the things and the materials they're using to do their sciences were important to those people. And you can actually see it layered into the constellations that sort of make up our night sky today. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, one more thing or two more things I want to show you here is that it doesn't stop there. The IAU, International Astronomical Union, then engaged, not only did they adopt the 88 constellations, their names, their definitions, and those are the ones, and that's the list, and those are the ones we have, uh, but they also put boundaries around them. And I actually don't know how I feel about this. So here you see that Hercules has now been sort of bordered, if you want. Uh, and the reason they're little square shapes is they follow lines of degrees, right? And the reason it's sort of shaped so it towards, towards the, uh, the top is that's where the North Pole is. So you can see that. I'll put boundaries around all of them there. And this kind of, this looks a little strange to me because it almost looks like, uh, like they're in jail. It's like, we look, you know, we're trying to sort of like sort out what stars belong to what area. And that's part of cattle logging and it's part of the thing. But but to me, it just seems like uh, this is like a step too far. I think uh, I like the idea that there's a little bit of sort of like ne nebulous kind of a, a, a part of the night sky. All these ancient people and these ancient stories and these things are sort of like flying around up there. They're, they're real and they're sort of uh, uh, kind of part of the sky. I sort of like get romantic about that kind of thing. But anyway, this is, this is where we're in today. 88 constellations, not only are they established but there is a border. Every single square inch of the sky actually has some sort of constellation it belongs to, and they're all described this way. Uh, the last thing I want to do, and I'm going to try to get a um, with this thing, and then I'm going to take another quick little break here, um, is um, I, I'm going to do a little break. We're going to talk a little questions, and then I'm going to come back with, um, with my planetarium thing. And I want to show you one more thing about Hercules that's really exciting. There is a little object right here. 
And so, and it's an uh, open cluster to you, to a naked eye, to an uh, unaided without any kind of instruments or anything. It looks like a little fuzzball. And you probably have to be away from the Phoenix lights to see this. I'll bet our friends up at Fountain Hills can if they know where to look. Certainly I've seen it when I'm in camping trips, when I'm in Northern Arizona, all that stuff. It's, a, it's a really obvious when you know where to look at it. And so the way to find that is this is that keystone. This is that shape that makes up sort of the trunk of Hercules. And uh, if you sort of look two thirds of the way down on this particular leg, it's right in between these two stars, but favoring this side about two thirds this way, one third this way. And it's a little sort of uh, a ball. It has a catalog number. It's called M13. We're going to get to that in a moment. So I am going to take uh, this moment to take another quick break, another quick poll. I'm going to come back with another uh, little device to show you uh, M13, and then we'll see where we go. Alicia, take it over. Here we go. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm going to launch our first poll. We have two, um, and we're going to split them up a little differently this time. So I'm going to launch our first poll right now, and then I'll have Alex jump on and take a question, and then we'll take our second poll and second question. Um, but the first question is, will you go outside and look at the edit Aquarids uh, that are happening tonight? So go ahead and answer whether or not you'll be joining us outside. Uh, and Alex, if you have any questions you'd like to take, you can do that now. Yes, I do. Um, I have a question from Michael who asks, have there been other constellations discovered in other galaxies? Very good question. Oh, um, the problem, question. Yeah. so the problem with that is, um, I'm just gonna answer it, not, no. And that's because uh, constellations are shapes within individual stars and even the closest galaxy Andromeda in our local cluster um, we really can't see them clearly enough to make up individual stars and start con to construct shapes. They're either too densely uh, close together and they're so far away that we really can't make the same shapes that we do in our night sky because all of the constellations in our night sky are stars in the Milky Way. So other galaxies, we just can't see the stars um, by themselves to create those shapes. So good question. And that's, uh, that's all the ones we have. I like that. So. Wonderful. Uh, and with that, we will take our next and our last poll question of this evening. I'll launch that poll. How many constellations are there in the night sky? Um, go ahead and cast your vote. <laughs> I think sky got cut off a little bit. Um, but how many constellations are there in the night sky? 66, 88, 112, or 157? You better get this right. I said it like seven times. So <laughs> you, you can't did. get this one wrong. And it looks like 88% of us have gotten it right, uh, which is ironic because the answer <laughs> was 88. So great job listening. Uh, Rick, I believe uh, that brings us back to you. You guys did that on purpose, didn't you? Okay, I'm gonna, uh, this always takes a little, a moment to get shared. So I'm, what I'm using here now is an iPad. And uh, in this particular iPad, I have a, uh, a little uh, program I use uh, to sort of like uh, kind of look around my night sky. And so it'll come up here in a minute. There you go. Um, let's see, I can't see what you're saying because my poll question is in the way and let me get rid of that. Um, here's what I, I just sort of wanted to show right off the bat. So I'm looking uh, towards the Northeast right now. And you can see that this is 930 tonight. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that late. Uh, let me just kind of move you, move you back just a little bit. Oh my gosh, I just used the wrong thing. Hang on just a second. I got totally too many computers here. So uh, let me move you forward. These things are sort of rising just as we go. So I'm going to move you forward to about 930 or so. And you can see the two stars that we were engaged in, right? Here's Arcturus over here. Here's Vega over here. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to just draw this for you so you can see what's going on. So uh, Arcturus is that sort of bright star over here. And then I want you to notice here is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is high in the sky right now. This time of night, it's a great time of the year to see the Big Dipper. And I want you to remember that the stars that are at this end of the Big Dipper point towards the North Star, but you can use the handle of the Big Dipper to come back this way. And that arc, if you just continue the arc of the handle, you end up at a star called Arcturus. That's the one we were talking about. Remember in my uh, demonstration before, that's the sort of the brighter redder one. And Arcturus becomes uh, the anchor star for uh, a little constellation. I'll do the sticks real quick right here. And this is 
is Bootes. This is the guy that invented the plow and sort of sits there. Remember that right next to that was the crown. And so there's a little bit of a half circle right here. And this star I said was brighter than the rest of them. And I think I can spell it right. It's called Alpeca. Um, and uh, you'll see, you'll probably be able to find that. Then here's the keystone of Hercules, right? Remember this? And remember I said that between these two stars on the keystone on the outer side, there is embedded in that, uh, that little sort of Hercules cluster, that star cluster is right there. And then of course, uh, we also talked about Vega and Lyre and that stuff. And you saw that in the ancient star chart. And these are the four that we've been talking about today. Uh, I'll just sort of finish sort of putting some body on, uh, on uh, Hercules here. You sort of remember he's kneeling. So there's a foot that comes out that way. There's another the sort of foot that goes out that way. You sort of see see how he works there. These are um, these are, are not the easiest easiest things to find in the night sky, but they are findable in Phoenix, and that's really where I want to go. And then we also get this question every once in a while about what kind of telescope to have. What should I buy? Uh, this kind of comes to us, and and we don't typically recommend telescopes. We recommend you find star parties or a place to go look at some telescopes or see them in practice or talk to people that use telescopes. But I am going to sort of say think about binoculars. A lot of people just have binoculars in their house so for sports, for, um, for bird watching, for anything else. It actually gives you a different view of the night sky than you had before. And so I'm going to kind of uh, call up the uh, Hercules cluster there for a moment. <clears throat> And we're going to fly out to it. Let me see if I've still got it on the screen. So um, Hercules is going to kind of go into the background. I'm going to fly out there and we're going to get there and you'll start to see what this is. This is one of the most fascinating parts of, uh, of objects in the sky. Uh, this is called a globular cluster. It's a very, very dense, tightly compacted group of, of tens of thousands of stars. This one is really impossibly far away. It is so far beyond beyond the other stars of Hercules, uh, it's way out there, some 20,000 light years away. Uh, but it's very viewable in a binocular. It is noticeable. If you really get good, clear night skies, if you go camping this summer, if you get away from the city, and it sort of challenge you to look for this. It's up all summer. It's called M13. It's a beautiful uh, little cluster. And the, the better the telescope you have, nice set of binoculars, you'll start to resolve some of those little stars. Um, uh, six or eight inch telescope, you'll start to see a lot more resolution of those little stars. Uh, but globular clusters are important to our understanding of the sky. They're usually older stars. They date back to the very beginning of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. They tend to hover sort of in an area above and below the center bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, you can see a couple of them, a handful of them up there. Uh, M13 is one of them, the Hercules cluster. And I'm going to sort of encourage you to start thinking about binoculars as part of your night sky viewing. And this would be the really perfect target to try to go find with binoculars to see how good you are and if you can find these things. So uh, that's uh, kind of where I wanted to leave it tonight. I know we've been, been really dense with material. I uh, sort of uh, want you to just remember that the, the planets are up. You can start looking at them right now. Uh, you certainly find Mercury and Mars today. Venus might be set just below your, your view of the horizon just at the end of this program, but watch for it the next several nights and then watch for it as it sort of travels through the sky for the whole next uh, part of the year. Okay, I'm going to close my section of the program. I'm going to turn it back over. I think Alex is going to show you a resource that we talked about um, and uh, give you a little view of uh, something to look for that's going to help you with your night sky journey. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, let me share my... This thing. Let me see if I can stop share. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So I'm here to share a resource with everyone um, called Sky Maps. Um, so this is at skymaps.com. Um, if you just go to the website, uh, this is the main page that you get to. And what I'm going to show you is a way to get to a resource that can tell you what to look for this month in the night sky. So there's this monthly sky calendar. Um, that leads to a whole list of sky calendars if you want to look in the past, but we can look at May's for this year. You got a list of things you can see and the dates, but if you scroll down even further, you can download this really neat uh, PDF file that shows you a map of the night sky, a list of things happening. So you have like on the fifth, the Eta Aquarius meteor shower peaks. Uh, you can see that, you know, you got some moon phases. And then if you go to the next 
page, you can actually start to see some things that even Rick was talking about. You can see things that easily seen with the naked eye. Um, binoculars, you have like M13 right here. Um, that's another thing that you can see with binoculars and even, even telescope. And it gives you some definitions and even some uh, tips for observing the night sky. And this is just a useful resource and it's every month you can see these and see what you might be able to see in the night sky and what you might need to see it. So this is just a really quick resource. And I believe um, the Eta Aquarius are happening and Elise, you can actually talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Alex, for a wonderful resource of the week. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that I can talk to you about this week's current events. And this week uh, we have the Eta Aquarids. And so this is very exciting because this is something that's happening right now. It's happening tonight and tomorrow morning. Uh, the peak was around this morning and um, maybe a little bit into tonight. So make sure uh, we go out and look. Um, but what this is, this image was actually taken by NASA over in, uh, the northern part of Georgia. And this is actually an image of the Eta Aquarius or one of the Eta Aquarius. Uh, and it's really, really amazing because like I said, this is happening now. And it's something that we are fortunate enough to get to be able to see here in Arizona. Um, and so, it, or mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see it in the Northern Hemisphere, um, but the Southern Hemisphere is typically um, ideal for viewing. And so if you're wondering what uh, this aquarage or meteor shower is, um, so a meteor shower happens when we have a comet. And in this example, it's gonna be Halley's Comet. Um, so when a comet crosses uh, into Earth's orbit or passes through Earth's orbit, um, as this comet gets closer to the sun, bits of ice start to break off of it and start to melt. And so comets have ice on them, if I didn't mention that. Um, and so as the ice is melting, bits of debris and bits of little tiny pieces of dust are, are left floating in space. And so as the Earth continues its orbit, it crosses paths with the debris that's left by the comet. And that's how we get meteor showers. So for this example, for uh, Eta Aquarids, and that's happening right now, like I said. Um, and so what happened was Halley's Comet actually came and crossed orbit or crossed paths uh, with Earth's orbit and left us little trails of, of dust to kind of run into and cross, cr crash into, if you will. Um, and so that's what we're seeing when we see these meteor showers. We're just seeing bits of dust fragments. And so they're not very large. We're not going to see any meteor, uh, meteorites on the Earth because of this. A lot of people think just because we have meteor showers, we'll see meteorites. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, like I said, these are roughly the size of like a grain of sand. Um, and so they're not large enough to enter Earth's atmosphere and, and actually land on the surface. But we do get to see this beautiful shooting star effect um, from these, these comets, or I'm sorry, from this uh, meteor shower. And so, um, I guess I should go back really quick. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, we're able to see between 20 to 40 uh, meteors per hour, which is quite a lot. Um, and so the best time to do this would be when the sun's down, or I'm sorry, <laughs> obviously when the sun's down, but when the moon uh, is kind of down as well, and you're in that really, really dark period of time, um, it would be a great time to go somewhere where there's a, a lot less light pollution as possible, or even um, just go lay out in the grass, keep your feet pointed towards the east, um, and let your eyes adjust for, you know, 30 minutes or so, so that you get that full darkness effect and your eyes are, are fully ready for, um, for any uh, meteor shower that we may see or, or anything else exciting. So um, I highly encourage you to go out tonight and look out uh, at the sky and look for these Eta Aquarids. Um, and they happen yearly. So like I said, now's a great time to do that. Uh, and then here are future meteor showers that I have listed here. But as Alex mentioned in our resource of the week, uh, you, can find the, uh, you can find other events such as this on that website as well. Awesome. All right, oh, Rick, Thank I you. see you coming on. Did you, are you gonna I, take over I, now? I just wanted to just sort of stress a little bit about sort of some patience. I think we live in a kind of a world today where uh, I don't think any of us just sort of sit and do anything for 10, 20, 15, 20, 30 minutes. I just, but this is a chance to do that. I mean, you really, if you're going to see something like this, uh, you're going to just have to kind of be very, very patient, get comfortable, be in the lounge chair or something like that, and just really uh, kind of just let your mind drift, but keep your eyes on 
on the southern part of our sky uh, in a dark thing. And I'll, I'll bet you you've got these. These, these tend to be uh, rare, a little bit harder to see because they're they're way south. But th these tend to be a little bit brighter than some of the other meteor showers. So I don't know. It's it's something you might see it, yeah. you might not. But I just encourage you to try. It's a, it's a good exercise. So check your ring doorbell. Check your um, yeah, all those like next door apps. A lot of people in the past have posted videos of their ring doorbells catching little glimpses <laughs> you know, that's, of that's, this that's meteor shower. So I highly recommend looking at that too if you don't get out and check. Um, but I believe, Rick, now we have think, someone coming into the the screen. Uh, I think Kim is live from Kim, our water tower. Kim, yeah, Kim needs to sort of like uh, tell us a little bit about an event coming up next week. So go ahead, Kim. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Alicia and Rick. Um, so yeah, so I would just like to share an event that's coming up. Um, it is the um, end of the year 2021 NASA Psyche inspired online showcase. And um, if you're not familiar, the Psyche mission was selected by NASA's discovery program. And it's led by ASU um, by the principal investigator Lindy Elkins Stanton and deputy principal investigator Jim Bell. And the mission is a journey to the unique metal asteroid Psyche that's orbiting between the sun, orbiting the sun between the Mars and Jupiter, and it's launching in August of 2022. Um, the Psyche Inspired program um, is bringing undergrad students from any discipline or major to share the excitement and innovation of scientific and engineering content of NASA's Psyche mission with the public in new ways through artistic and creative works. And um, we would like to invite you to join us to celebrate these 15 immensely talented student artists um, for the showcase, which starts next week. And I will give you guys the link and I will share um, also information on the Psyche um, mission. So, so for this one, they can just, they basically use the link, they log in and they can just explore on their own, right? And it'll be Correct. up for a little while. Is that how this one works? That's great. So you're not looking for a specific time or anything, but this will be available to you. And uh, these students are absolutely remarkable. And it's so fun to see how inspired and how innovative they are in different ways. It's sort of like looking at this psyche phenomenon and this particular mission. It's great. So. Yeah. It starts Monday afternoon. Excellent. So you can register now for it and then get the reminder. And it runs for about two weeks. And it's it's really quite amazing the talent that, that these students bring with their artwork. They totally got to do that. Why wouldn't they want to do that? That's super. Okay. I love it. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. So, uh, and that is in your chat right now, or uh, and and it will that link will be arriving. We're going to send a follow up email to everybody, like a little survey. Okay, I'm going to kind of wind down real quickly and do a close. We try to keep it within an hour, and we almost never make it. Um, but I wanted to. Uh, uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, look for us again two weeks from now. We're going to do a little bit more talking about constellations, uh, how the sky works, the seasonality of the sky. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Arcturus and Bootes and then follow down to uh, uh, Virgo uh, and Spica, which is a, another star we're going to look at. So uh, more of that, update on planets, and we'll find some other things along the way. Uh, also next week, we will get in, be, or in two weeks on the 19th, we will be preparing you for a total eclipse of the moon that is one week later. So between our meeting on the 19th and our first meeting in June, uh, there's this big, really big uh, lunar eclipse happening. And so we'll uh, we'll bring everybody up to speed on that, how that's going to work and what to look for. So uh, lots going on. There's always something to do. I just, I just really appreciate when we do our polling, we find out many of you just are regular visitors and like to watch this particular program. I hope we're doing all right by you. And please send comments and Make sure uh, you keep us uh, keep us in mind as you uh, as you're uh, thinking of things. If you think of something else you want to see, or you have any really good uh, uh, feedback, then uh, we want to hear from you for sure. So uh, thanks to uh, my team, the students tonight, to Meg and to Kim, and we'll see you guys everybody in two weeks. Thank you very much.